morning, Thrive. My name is Marie Zell and I'm honored to be your online host for today. If this is your first time visiting us, please let us know. You can text NEW to 604-285-5770 and we will mail you a Thrive stainless steel water bottle. We are delighted to have you here at Thrive. In Mark 10 verse 14, Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. That's right, parents, we love children just like Jesus did. In fact, at Thrive Kids, we put in so much time and effort to create the weekly children lessons because we want to make sure that the kids have an amazing experience online, just like their parents. So don't forget to visit mythrive.info forward slash Thrive Kids for the kids activity and the Zoom class every Sunday. The supermarkets are filled with chocolate bars during October. What is your favorite chocolate bar? You can share your answer in the chat room or to the people sitting next to you. Speaking of chocolate bars, here's one fun fact about chocolate bars. Do you know what's the best selling chocolate bar in Canada? According to the Candy Fun House, the winning chocolate bar is the Cadbury Dairy Milk Chocolate Bar. They have been around since 1905. My most favorite Cadbury bar is the whole nut one. We really miss seeing you here at Thrive. Take a selfie of yourself watching from home and share it on your social media. Don't forget to add Hashtag Thrive Church Online. Now sit back and stay focused for this powerful message from Pastor JB. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Thrive Church Online. It is so great to have you here. My name is JB. I'm one of the pastors here at Thrive. And if you're joining us for the first time, if you've never been to Thrive before, a huge welcome to you, especially you are what we call our VIP. Everyone say our VIP. And we especially want to welcome you. In fact, if you want to go to mythrive.info and you touch the button new to Thrive, we've got a very special gift waiting just for you. It's your very own Thrive Church stainless steel water bottle that we'd love to send straight to your door as just a way to say thank you so much for joining us on this very special Sunday. Can we give all of our VIPs a big shout in this place right now and just welcome the church today? In fact, welcoming is not just what we do, it's who we are here at Thrive. And so with that in mind, we just welcome one another to church right now in your chat rooms. Maybe you're sitting beside someone as you're watching the service. We'd give them a high five, a handshake, a warm hug, or an air high five, an air handshake, or an air hug, whatever is appropriate. Let's welcome one another to church today. Would you turn to everyone and say, it's so great to see you here today. So great to have you here today. Welcome to Thrive Church Online, everybody. It's always a joy to spend time with you. If there's ways we can be praying for you, please let us know. You can press the prayer request button. If there's other info that you could uh, re you know, receive from us that would be helpful for you, feel free to go to mythrive.info for more next steps. But we are so glad to be worshiping God together on this very special Sunday. You know, one of the happiest things that we get to do here at Thrive Church is we get to baptize people. And in fact, baptism is not a graduation. It's not saying, oh, look, at me I'm this perfect Christian but it's very much a beginning it's saying I am someone who uh, needs a savior his name is Jesus I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins he rose again from the grave and if that's you and you've never been baptized before then guess what baptism is that next step that the Bible talks about ta you taking as the next step in your faith journey well this past Sunday was a really special Sunday because in this time that we've been doing online services we've not being on on site because of COVID-19 we haven't been doing baptisms the way you used to with everybody you know jumping into one pool here instead we've been you know, arranging private baptism ceremonies for different people in a physical distance kind of way and so it is so uh, you know such an exciting thing for me to announce to you that this past Sunday we baptized Amber let's give Amber a big hand a big shout in this place together right now praise God 
And man, I've been in some cold baptism pools before, but this was probably the coldest water I think we've ever baptized anyone in. But Amber was so brave. She still wanted to do it outside. We met at Jericho Beach and we baptized her in the very cold water. And you know, she was like, you know, at least it's not glacier water. And she was amazing about that. She was super brave and she got baptized. This is a way to declare her faith in Jesus. In fact, take a look right now. Amber, two questions to ask you. Number one. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again, and he's alive today? If you do, then please say, I do. I do. Woo! Number two, Amber, have you received Jesus Christ as your savior, and you want to follow him? If you have, then please say, I have. I have. All right. Here we go. Amber, because you received Jesus Christ as your savior, I now baptize you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here we go. Praise God. Can we give God a big hand, a big shout for that right now? Super proud of Amber. And on that same day, we also baptized Grace. And Grace, actually, I don't know if you know this, but in fact, every single time we have Thrive Church online, Grace is actually right behind the camera that you are looking through to me and I'm looking at you through. She's actually right behind. In fact, Grace, why don't you just show your hand? Just Can, can you just wave your hand in front of the camera right now? Can you just show your hand? Can you do that? Just do it. No, she's just shy. No, just show your hand in front of the camera. In front of the camera. In front of the camera. Yeah, in front of the camera. Just, just go. There you go. Yeah, there you go. That's Grace's hand. For those of you who are wondering, that's Grace's hand. And see, Grace is normally behind the camera, but on this this past Sunday, we actually got a chance to get her in front of the camera because it was time for her baptism. And we were so excited about that. In fact, take a look at Grace's baptism right now. All right, welcome everyone to Grace's baptism. Right now, I've got two questions to ask Grace. Question number one, Grace, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again and is alive today? If you do, please say, I do. I do. Question number two, Grace, have you received Jesus Christ as your savior? If you haven't, please say, I have. I have. All right, give Grace a big hand. Woo! Right. Here we go. Are you okay? Okay, okay. ready? Grace, because you received Jesus Christ as your savior. And I, now, it gives you a great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here we go. Praise God, isn't that amazing? Super proud of Grace, and it was just, it was, the water was cold, but she was super brave. You gotta really believe in Jesus if you wanna get baptized in that kind of temperature of water. Uh, but we're so proud of Grace and Amber for taking that next step. If you have not taken that step of getting baptized yet, we would love to arrange a private baptism for you in whatever way you feel comfortable. You can go to mythought.info and touch the word baptism there. We'd love to get that organized for you. It's an awesome way, a happy way to celebrate our faith in Jesus and to honor Jesus for what he He's done for us on the cross. If you believe us, say amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, a big welcome to each and every one of you here to Thrive Church Online. I'm super excited to bring the message for all of you right now. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you right now to grab your Bibles if you have one. If you wouldn't mind just grabbing your Bibles, maybe yours is a paper Bible like mine, maybe yours is a device that you download the Bible into. Either way is cool. Why don't you just hold up your Bible like so, and we're just make this proclamation together in faith as a fun way to get our hearts ready for the message today. Would you hold up your Bibles right now? And let's say this together in faith. We're going to say, this is my Bible. It is God's Word. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I open up my heart so that God's going to come in and change my life. And I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Hey, if you're new to Thrive, you're new to church, or you're new to faith, you're new to the Bible, you're exploring, and just you, you won't consider yourself a Christian, but you're just kind of here because you're curious, we are so glad that you're here. We hope you find that Thrive is a safe place for you, a place where you can just be yourself, a place where you can explore your questions, a place where you can find some community, a place where you can find hope and encouragement for your life today. So glad that you're here. In fact, you've come at a great time because we're doing a series here at Thrive. It's called Happier You. Everyone say Happier You. Happier You. This series is about learning the secrets to a happier you. Now that's not to say that if you're struggling today with depression or you're grieving the loss of someone you love or you are trying to get up from a fall, you're just going through a generally tough time right now. I'm not here to say through the series that somehow that you can magically become happy, happy, joyful, joyful all the time. That's not the point of the series. But what we're saying in this series is that if you would take to heart and apply the lessons we're talking about in this series called Happier You, 
you, we can learn to be happier. And see, this is because we believe that happiness isn't just the sum of your circumstances, it's the product of our habits. That happiness isn't just a trait that you either have or don't have, a trait that you either born with or without, but happiness is a skill that we can learn and get better at over time. That's why a couple weeks ago I shared with you happier you secret number one, which is give thanks in every circumstance. Is that no matter how bad your situation might be, if you would choose an attitude of gratitude, and if you would choose to give thanks even in that tough circumstance, it will change your perspective. It'll allow you to stay afloat when your circumstances make you want to sink. Turn to your neighbor and say, choose an attitude of gratitude. Choose an attitude of gratitude. That's the first secret to a happier you that we talked about. The second secret to a happier you that we talked about, we talked about last week, and that is to be present in the moment. Have you guys enjoyed this series so far? We've had an amazing time this series. In fact, this has probably been one of my most favorite series we've ever done here at Thrive, and we're only into week three. The fact is, this is a five-week series. If you've missed any of the messages so far, I invite you to go to our podcast or go to our social media and check out those messages that you missed. And we are doing a five-week series. We hope you'll join us for all five weeks, and we hope you'll benefit from it. Today, I'm super excited to give you secret number three to a happier you. Are you guys ready for secret number three? Well, here we go. Today, I want to give you the title of today's message. It'll give you a clue to what we're talking about today. The title of today's message might surprise you. It might not be a message title that you would expect for a message from a sermon or at a church, but here is the message. I hope you take some good notes. The message title today is, I'm going to own you. I'm going to own you. Would you turn to your neighbor and just for fun, would you just tell them, I'm going to own you. I'm going to own you. You know, some of the people who are coming late into the service will be, what are they talking about today? What's going on? See, here's the thing. Today, the message is called, I'm going to own you. That's because happier you, secret number three that I'm here to share with you is take ownership of your happiness. Take ownership of your happiness. You know, Abraham Lincoln, who's widely acclaimed as one of the greatest presidents in U.S. history, was once quoted as saying, most folks are usually about as happy as they make their minds up to be. See, what was honest Abe Lincoln saying is that instead of crediting your happiness or blaming your unhappiness on someone or something, we need to take ownership of our happiness. It reminds me of a joke that I once heard, which is that there are these two guys working at a factory. At 12 p.m. noontime, woo, the whistle blows, it's lunchtime, and so these two guys, they go to the same park bench where they always have their lunch, and the one of the guys, he opens up his lunchbox, he takes out a bologna sandwich, and he starts to scream, oh my goodness, bologna sandwich again? This is the third bologna sandwich I've eaten this week. I have I hate bologna sandwiches. Why is it that every day I reach into my lunchbox and what I get is a bologna sandwich? I don't like bologna. I hate bologna. And the other guy's like, oh, wait, 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 calm down. Come on. It's okay. It's all right. Don't worry. You'll just calm down. See, all you have to do, just go home and tell your wife that you don't want a bologna sandwich. Hey, 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 leave my wife out of this because I fix my own lunch. I fix my own lunch. See, see what's the lesson there? is that most of the baloney we encounter in life, we packed ourselves. We packed it ourselves. Today we're talking about owning your happiness, taking ownership of your happiness. See, happiness is not just something that we run into by accident. Happiness isn't some mysterious thing that is completely out of our control, but to a huge extent, happiness or unhappiness is something that we create for ourselves. You know, author John Maxwell, he says this, is that some people, they have what he calls destination disease. Is that if they think, they think that if they just move to that city, or they meet that special someone, or they go and get that job, that somehow their life will change and they will be happy. But little do they know that after, actually happiness has less to do with what's going on outside of you, and more to do with what's going on the inside of you. If you believe that, say amen. And that's why we need to learn to take ownership of our own happiness. How do you take ownership of your happiness? See, long before Abe Lincoln talked about owning your happiness, over and over, the Bible talks about taking ownership of your happiness. And so today I want to share with you three ways that the Bible talks about how we can take ownership of our happiness. And I hope you take some good notes in this place. I believe it's going to benefit you today. See, three ways to take ownership of your happiness. Number one, see happiness not as your entitlement you're owed, but as your responsibility to find. Let me say that again. See happiness 
not as an entitlement you are owed, but as your responsibility to find. See, what do I mean by that? See, some people, they think, if I do all the right things, then I deserve to be happy. That, you know, happiness is almost like an entitlement that they're owed. Look at all the good that I do. Look at all the sacrifices I make. Look at all the ways I slave away and all the commands I try to obey. And look how happiness has still eluded me. Why am I still so unhappy? And some people, they might even put a spiritual spin on it and blame God for it and say, God, you know, look at all the good that I did. Look at all the good that I do. And look how unhappy I still am. You failed me. God. You haven't been fair to me, God. Why am I still so unhappy? Have you ever felt that way before? If you have, then you're not alone. In fact, once Jesus told a story about two sons and a father, it's quite possibly the most famous story Jesus told. It's probably, it could possibly be the most famous story coming out of the Bible, but we're not going to unpack every single lesson from this powerful story, but let me just tell you one thing. See, in that story, you remember the story, the younger son thinks to himself, man, I would be so much happier if I just lived life my way, on my own terms, rather than living in my father's house. And so he demands his share of the family inheritance and he takes it, he runs away with it, he spends all of it on things that he thinks are going to make him happy, but at the end of the day, he's just financially broke, he's emotionally and relationally and spiritually bankrupt, and he decides, I just need to return to my father's house, and in an amazing display of compassion and love and undeserved kindness, his father runs to him, embraces him, kisses him, welcomes him back, and throws a party to celebrate his return. And While the party's going on, the father goes out to the older son and he invites him to come and celebrate the return of the younger son. But the older son refuses. Look at Luke chapter 15, verse 29. What does he say? He says, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? And then what does the father say in reply? Verse 31, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. See, what was the older son's mistake? See, the older son thought that by doing all the things he thought his father wanted him to do, that his father owed him that his father owed him happiness, but didn't give him happiness, didn't give him anything. And the father says to the older son, what do you mean I never gave you anything? Everything I have is already yours, son. You've just failed to enjoy it. And see, the mistake that the older son made was he saw happiness as his entitlement, something that someone owed him rather than his own responsibility to find. And see, how many of us are like the older son? is that we think that because we're doing all the right things, that somehow God owes us, that God owes us happiness, or God owes us health, or God owes us wealth, or God owes us power. Guess what? That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the gospel is that Jesus came to give us life to the full, and that through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, that we now, today, have access to all that we need to live the fullest life possible, and it was just because we got God's forgiveness, we got God's God's peace, we got God's purpose, we have God's hope, we have a second chance, we have a family to belong to, and the question now is, what are you going to do with what God has made available to you? Are you going to put these gifts to work, or are you going to bury them in the ground, pretend they don't exist, and say that God never gave you anything? See, the thing I'm here to tell you today is we got to take ownership of our happiness. See, happiness, write this down, happiness is not an entitlement you're owed, it's a responsibility you own. Happiness is not an entitlement you're owed. It's a responsibility you own. You're responsible for your own happiness. Let me put it another way. It's not God's job to make you happy. It's not your spouse's job to make you happy. It's not your parents' job to make you happy. It's not your boss's job to make you happy. It's not your friend's job to make you happy. It's not your boyfriend or girlfriend's job to make you happy. You know whose responsibility your your happiness is? It's your responsibility. See, for your sake, for God's sake, for the sake of those closest to you, you and I, we need to take responsibility for our own happiness. If you believe that, say amen. 
And if you're waiting for God to somehow make you happy, or you're waiting for some news to make you happy, you're waiting for some circumstance in your life to change so that you can become happy, then you've got the wrong idea of what happiness is and where happiness comes from. Oh, but JB, don't, don't you read the book of James, New Testament? Doesn't it say that every good and perfect gift is from God? Yes, it does. Oh, oh but in, in the Old Testament, in Ecclesiastes 5, doesn't it say that, you know, when a person can enjoy their work and be happy, that that is a gift from God? Yes, it does say that. So it doesn't that mean that happiness is all from God? It's, it's God's choice? It's up to God? No, not so fast. See, I believe that God gave us the ability to be happy just the same way that he gave us the ability to produce wealth, to love others and be loved, the ability to trust in him, is that the ability is there. The ability is already given. The question is, what are you going to do with that ability that God has already given you? See, that's why Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. See, what's Paul doing here? Why, why does Paul command the people in his church in the town of Philippi to rejoice always. Isn't, isn't that kind of unfair? Doesn't he know that they've got problems? Doesn't he know that they've got financial issues? Doesn't, doesn't he know that they've got marriage issues? Doesn't he know that it's unrealistic? No, this is the thing. If joy and happiness were feelings that are totally out of control, then Paul has no business telling people to rejoice always. And I say it again, rejoice. But the fact is this, joy and happiness are not simply feelings that are out of our control. They're choices that we make. Happiness is an attitude we choose. That's why he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. It's because every day we want to make the choice to rejoice. It's about taking ownership of your happiness. Until the day you take ownership of your happiness, nothing and no one is going to make you happy. And that's why, and I, I don't know if you know this, is that uh, on my days off, as well as on vacation, I will actually have a special belt that I'll wear. I call it my vacation belt. And uh, don't get me wrong, it's not some kind of magic belt where I put on the belt and oh, I'm happy all the time. No, it's not like, it's not like that, but it's, it's actually much the opposite, is that sometimes on my day off, I will wear it, it, and it doesn't look that different from any normal belt. This is another belt that I wear, but I'll, I'll put on my vacation belt on my day off. And for me, it's a reminder that today, I'm responsible for my own happiness. Today, I want to put on an attitude of gratitude. Today, I want to make sure that I enjoy this day. Amen. And sometimes Bradley will pay, hey, do you have your, do you have your day off? Do you have your vacation belt on? Because it's, it's, it's something that they, they know about, now you know about. In fact, I could, I could probably do a whole sermon on just the clothes that I wear. Maybe one day we'll just do Thrive Church Online from my closet, if that's okay with Pastor Shar. We're going to do it from our closet because I've got a lot to say from my clothes alone. But that's the thing. It's about taking ownership of your happiness, that your happiness is not an entitled that you're owed. It's a responsibility you own. It's up to you. Tell me, remember to say, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. That's the first thing that the Bible tells us about taking ownership of your happiness. There's a second thing that we can know about taking ownership of, of your happiness from the Bible. Number two, do a happiness inventory. Do a happiness inventory. In other words, take the time to understand how God made you and what things make you particularly happy. Look at Psalm 139 verses 13 to 14 with me and read it with me in a big loud voice. It says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. David, he's writing this as a prayer to God. He's saying, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, you're so wonderfully made. You're so wonderfully made. That's not a pickup line unless you want it to be. You're so wonderfully made. He, what's, what's going on? See, David, he is praising God because he understands how God made him how God wired him. And there's a lesson in that for us when we talk about happiness, is that if you want to take ownership of your happiness, it's important to understand how God made you, what makes you happy, how you are wired. That's why we need to do what I call a happiness inventory. In other words, you need to take stock of what makes you happy. How do you do that? Well, let me give you a few tips on how you do a happiness inventory. One step you want to take is make a list of the happiest moments in your life. 
Just take five minutes and just off the top of your head, make a list of the happiest moments of your life. You might want to do this after the service or maybe, I don't know if you can multitask this, maybe even right now, but just like just the, the, the top 10 happiest moments of your life, if you can think of them. If, if I had to share with you my happiest moments, uh, I, I would say if, the, if I could give you like my top five, top 10, here, here, here you go, are you ready? Go, go with them really fast. Number one, my wedding day. All right, number one, my wedding day, happiest day of my life. Number two, my, the birth of my older son, Bradley. Number three, the birth of my younger son, Caleb. In fact, all those three are kind of like 1A, 1B, 1C, uh, because they're all kind of wrapped in one. Number four, my ordination as a pastor. Number five, spending time with my family. Number six, big Sundays at Thrive. I'm talking about Easter, Christmas, Thanksgiving. When we see the whole church come together, invite the community, invite their friends, and we see lots of people come to know Jesus as their Savior. To me, there are a few things that beat that. Number seven, baptisms at Thrive. When people declare their faith in Jesus, they get dunked in water. For me, it doesn't get any better than that. My own baptism included. You know, n- number eight, you know, when, times when I've experienced God's presence and God's power in an especially personal or intimate way. That's a, that's a happy moment for me. Number nine, you know, this might sound weird to you, but planning with, my, with our church staff. Is that for me, for some reason, the way that I've been wired is that I love planning for church. I love strategizing. I love dreaming. I love, you know, seeing how the church can be more effective. And, and I love doing that with an amazing team that we have here at Thrive. And in fact, sometimes I love the process almost as much as I love seeing the results. It's just because that's the way I'm wired. And I'm just so blessed to be part of an amazing team. And number 10 is memories that I have with certain friends. If I had to come up with my top 10 happiest moments, I think that would be a pretty close list of my top 10 happiest moments. But see, how about you? Your, your happiest moments are probably not going to be exactly the same as mine. What are your happiest moments, if you think of them, from your childhood, from growing up, maybe just recently? I want you to list those happiest moments, and then I want you to ask yourself a question. Look at those happiest moments and ask yourself, why are those my happiest moments? Is there a common theme that threads through these happiest moments? Is there any lesson that I can learn by understanding these to be my happiest moments? See, I can, I can tell you this. When I think about my happiest moments, there are some common denominators or common themes that thread through those moments. First of all, my happiest moments weren't just moments that made me feel good at the time. But their moments, my happiest moments, are moments when I feel good looking back at it years later. And see, in fact, I, I can say that my memory of those moments is just as sweet and maybe even sweeter than the actual experience itself. It's because my happiest moments weren't just I felt good at that moment, but my happiest moments are when I look back and go, man, I'm so glad that happened. That, that's, that's something that I noticed about my happiest moments. Another thing I noticed about my happiest moments is that a lot of them came only after a long, big struggle. Do you find that for yourself as well? So, for example, you know, when, what made those big Sundays at Thrive for us, for me, so sweet? You know, Thanksgiving, you know, Christmas, Easter. For me, what makes it so sweet is seeing our entire church rallying together for a common cause. It's, it's, it's seeing our entire serving team at church working so hard, you know, you know, losing sleep, giving their best in all these different areas, and all of us come together in such a united way to do something great. And at the end, when we see the payoff of lives changed for Jesus, records broken, for me, it's like going up a mountain, and even though I'm tired, even though I'm exhausted, even though I gave it my all, I see the view at the end, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad we did this. It was worth it to do it, and it's because it came after a long struggle, so you treasure it more. You know, part part of the reason why I think the birth of my sons is so sweet is because, you know, you got nine months of waiting and anticipating and praying and the weight gain, the aches, the pains, the sleepless nights, the nausea, and I'm just talking about myself and what I experienced. I I don't know what Pastor Shar experienced, but but I'm just, she probably went through something similar, but the thing is this, is that when we finally got to hold that child in our arms, it made all the pain and trouble worth it, and you're like, what? That made it all worth it. I'm so glad we did that. A a third common denominator that I find with all my happiest moments is that because, like, they were happy because directly or indirectly, they somehow affirmed or confirmed who I am or who I believe God made me to be, or who I believe I was born to be, or who, what I believe I was born to do. For example, when I was you know, finally ordained as a pastor, we'd been leading Thrive Church, planted Thrive Church for six years already. But when you know, I was confirmed and commissioned and ordained as a pastor, it was for me one of the happiest moments of my life because it confirmed and affirmed for me who I always believed I could be, or who I always dreamed I would be, or what I always dreamed about doing. And so in that way, it was a really happy moment. Lastly, when I looked at all the happiest moments of my life, one more common theme. Do you know what it was? 
is that my happiest moments always involved other people. It was never just on my own. You know, I've got, you know, personal, you know, solo accomplishments or achievements that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm thankful for, but they don't make the top 15 on my list because for some reason, at least the way that I'm wired, it's like it doesn't compare to when I experience it with other people that I care about. And that's why it makes us so happy. When you've got someone to share that with, it makes us so happy. See, when you know the common themes that thread through your happiest moments in life, it allows you to better appreciate how God made you, what makes you happy, and how to pursue happiness in the future. See, for example, when you know that your happiest moments often come after a long struggle, then that means if you're going through a tough struggle right now, don't give up. It's because whatever tough time you're going through right now, see it as a lead up to your next happiest moment because the best is yet to come, amen. And, or if you know that your happiest moments involve you doing what you were good at or you doing what you were born to do, then do you want Keep doing what you're born to do. Don't be distracted by other things, but focus on that. You know, if you know that your happiest moments weren't just solo achievements, but they're moments that were shared with others, then guess what? That means don't cut off your relationships with people. Don't quarantine yourself from other relationships. Keep on investing in your relationships. Keep on getting better at working with other people. See, what are we doing? We are taking inventory of the way God made us so that we can take ownership of our happiness. Amen. Amen. T turn your neighbor and say, you got to take inventory. You got to take inventory. That's right. You got to take stock of your happiness. Here's another way you can take inventory. Identify your happiness helpers. Identify your happiness helpers. See, what are happiness helpers? Let me tell you what happiness helpers are. Happiness helpers are little things that give you an emotional lift. See, happiness helpers are little things that you can actually experience pretty often or repeatedly that give you an emotional lift. So you're going to find that happiness helpers are different from your happiest moments. See, your happiest, happiest moments will often be single, isolated moments that you cannot repeat. For example, if your happiest day was you getting married, guess what? You're not going to get married every week, right? You're not getting married every month or every, at least I hope you don't, right? In, in contrast though, happiness helpers are little things that you'd experience repeatedly that bring a sense of joy, a a sense of peace, a sense of comfort, a sense of refreshing into your life. Do you have happiness helpers? Of course you do. Do you want to know some of mine? Let me give you, in no particular order, some of my happiness helpers. Not all of them, but just some, all right? Um, when I play NBA 2K19, that is, when I win, that's a happiness helper. When I lose, when my team loses, that's a happiness killer, all right? So that, that's, that's, that, 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 that's a double-edged sword there. Now, another one, another happiness helper, exercising, working out, going to the gym, going for a run. That for me, I just feel good as I'm doing it and while I'm doing it, after I do it, is that it just, it's a happiness helper for me. You know another happiness helper? A good meal. Oh, like a steak from Costco done at my home? Oh my goodness, that's like heaven on earth for me, right? Or, or like a chocolate chunk cookie from Subway? Um, or a, like a, a chocolate chip muffin from Tim Hortons, or a bubble tea from Jinju Dan, or like a, a kid's cone in a cup with brownie on top from DQ. All of these, make, all of these give me a lift while making me heavier at the same time. It's kind of ironic, but they, 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 these are all happiness helpers. And by the way, for those of you who've ever given me a DQ gift card, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the fact is this, is no need to give me any more DQ money, okay? Because the fact is, I've got more than I can handle. I, I've got more DQ money. Uh, I, I've probably got enough to buy a small house now or a small car. And, but the only problem is that no one accepts DQ money except for DQ. And I got to watch this waste. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you. I love you guys. You guys are amazing. Love you guys. Thank you so much for that. But I'm good. No more, no more DQ money for me. I'm, I'm good. Thank you so much. You know what's another game changer, a, a happiness helper? Let me tell you, a game changing happiness helper for me, a good night's sleep. Oh, and all the people said, amen, right? It's, it, I, I got to tell you this, is that, you know, especially for parents of young children, you can totally relate to this, right? It's like me without a good night's sleep, that's like me before I met Jesus, all right? I'm grumpy, I'm irritable, I'm frustrated, I'm complaining a lot, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Me after a good night's sleep, that's like me after I got baptized. Oh my goodness, it's like, oh, I'm joyful, I'm, I'm perky, I, I'm, I'm like, you know, best is yet to come, you know, that, that, that's me after after a good night's sleep. And so a good night's sleep, oh, is a game-changing happiness helper for me. Maybe for you as well. Another one, time in God's presence. 
is that when I spend time with God just on my own, that's something that refreshes me. It's something that Jesus died for, that we have a daily relationship with him. Another one, this was a huge one, being with my church family, being with you guys. You guys, being with you is one of the biggest happiness helpers of my life. And that's why we meet this way on Sundays. That's why we meet for prayer meetings. That's why we meet for small groups. It's because being together, there's something about that that brings happiness to me. I just love being with you guys, and hopefully you love it as well. Being with good friends, listening to BTS, you know, light it up like dynamite, you know, just little things, you know, a good movie, you know, you know it's, I, I put on the Interstellar the other day, love that movie, and, and see, here's the thing, is that these are my happiness helpers. How about you? See, your happiness helpers will be different from mine, because we're not the same. We're all wired differently. Maybe your idea of a happiness helper is the shopping mall, like Richmond Center, or Amazon.ca, or Prime Days, you know, what, we're, by the way, we're going to talk about money next week, or, ne- or ne- next month, and November. The point is this. You got to discover how God wired you so you can know what makes you happy. In case you're having a tough time identifying what your happiness helpers are, the fact is researchers actually found that there are some happiness helpers that tend to be universal, that tend to apply to everybody or most people. And if you want to know what those are, then I want to encourage you to go in your small groups or sign up for a small group this coming week because I'm going to give you some bonus content on what those universal happiness helpers are. If you're curious about that, if you want to check that out, make sure you join a small group this coming week. And here's another way you can take inventory. Is this helpful in this place so far? Another way to take inventory, not just, don't just identify your happiness helpers, but identify what I call your happiness killers. See, just as we all have things that give us a lift, those are our happiness helpers, we also have some things called happiness killers. These are situations that tend to make us unhappy, that tend to bring out the worst in us, that, we, that are best for us to avoid as much as we can. See, what are your happiness killers? Do you want to hear some of mine? Just really quickly, a few happiness killers for me. When I put too much on my plate, when I get overly busy, when I become this multitasking monster, and I talked about that in present in the moment last week in episode two. You know, another one is when I feel underappreciated. You know, when, you know, I, well, sometimes I can get in this funk where, oh, no one appreciates what I do. No one appreciates my hard work. Oh, no one's encouraging me. And, and this is the thing. Sometimes I get into that kind of slump, and actually, you know what I do to help fight against that happiness killer? You know what I do? You know all those cards and notes that you guys write for my birthday? Those gifts, those videos you guys make? I actually keep them in my car so that whenever I'm feeling discouraged, whenever I'm about to throw a pity party for myself, I'll actually get out your cards and your notes and I'll turn on your videos and I'll read or watch what it is that you guys have written and filmed and said because it helps me so very much to realize that you know what life is actually not nearly as bad as I'm making out to be I'm actually extremely blessed amen and and see that's me trying to defend against a happiness killer in my life called feeling unappreciated and so I want to thank you guys so much for every single person who's ever written a note ever sent me a text ever written an email ever done anything like written a card sent a video that means so much to me more than you can possibly know. Thank you guys. Thank you for being my happiness helpers. Another one is this. When I experience guilt or shame from sin, I'm warning that in a bit. Finally, another happiness killer for me, when my wife and I get into a conflict is that, you know, Charlene and I, we have been married for 17 years now, praise God, yet yeah, we got married when we were 12 years old, praise God, I'm kidding about that, but the fact is that we, you know, have an awesome marriage. I think we've got an amazing relationship. She's my best friend, I think we're more in love today than we were 17 years ago, but do we get into conflicts and spats and arguments? Yes, we do. Oh, yes, we do. And this is the thing, I find this, and I think she would say the same thing, is that when there's strain in that relationship, the stress of that is worse than any stress I go through at work. It's just a different kind of stress. And this is the thing. In relationships, conflict is inevitable. You cannot avoid conflict all the time in a close relationship. But what you can do, what is within your control, is you don't need to let the conflict linger too long. That's why the Bible says don't let the sun go down uh, like, uh, while you're still angry. And so I find a, a way to fight against that happiness killer in my life is to resolve conflicts early. And that's one thing we're going to talk about later on in this series. But see, what are your happiness killers? See, maybe for you, a happiness killer is too much social media 
or maybe it happens clear for you is when you hang out with a certain crowd and you find that it brings out the worst in you instead of the best in you. See, once you've identified your happiness helpers and your happiness killers, what should you do? Here are a couple things you can do. Number one is build into your daily and weekly schedule opportunities to experience a happiness helper. So that's what I'll do. You know, I'll put little rewards for myself into the week. You know, I'll say, well, after I, I finish that project, I'm going to go and get some ice cream. Or, you know, after I preach the sermon, I'm going to have a dad's root beer. Or, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to put on a movie that I enjoy. It's building into my daily or weekly schedule opportunities to experience a bit of happiness. It's taking ownership of your happiness. Here's another thing, is that do your best to avoid those situations where you will likely experience a happiness killer. So that since, for example, since I am grumpiest when I'm tired, one thing I've learned over time, and it's taken me a while to admit it, but I, ne- I realize it's, this is the case, is that I need to avoid as much as possible staying up after 12 a.m. That's, that, that's for me, because otherwise I'm not going to get enough sleep. And before when I was 20 years old, I could stay up all night, and I'm fine the next day. Not, this, not at this age anymore. And see, that's called taking ownership of your happiness. Look at John 4.34 with me. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, what is Jesus saying? See, Jesus is saying, my food, i.e. what satisfies me, what fuels me, what makes me happy, what I enjoy is to do the will of the Father. And see, what's the lesson here? Is that Jesus knew how he was wired. Jesus knew what made him happy. Jesus knew what his happiness helpers and happiness killers were, and he lived his life based on that. Jesus didn't wait for someone else to make him happy. He went after his own happiness. He took ownership of his happiness, and we need to do the same. Amen. Amen. Final point before we end today. If you want to take ownership of your happiness, realize that the only way your happiness can be full and lasting is through a close relationship with God. See, earlier today, we talked about Jesus' parable about the two sons. So many lessons we can unpack from that. In fact, if you want to unpack a lot of those lessons, I encourage you to go to a a message that I preached back in March of 2019. March 17, 2019, did a sermon called, uh, It's I'm not okay, but it's okay. It's actually one of my favorite sermons of all time. I'm not okay, but it's okay. You can check that out. And by the way, if you're not okay, it's okay. I'm not trying to make light of what you're going through. But the fact is, just because we're doing a series called Happier You, don't feel like you're expected to be happy at church all the time. Because the fact is, you can be just yourself. The Bible says so. God says so. And I'm here to tell you as well. God loves you, and we love you just the way you are. Amen? Amen. So keep that in mind. But see, this parable about the two sons has so many lessons. But the one lesson that I want to tell you today— This parable shows us two mistaken approaches to happiness. See, the older son's mistaken approach to happiness was that he thought happiness was something that someone else owed him. That something, it was something that other people had to give him. So he's like, life is unfair because no one's given me anything. And, and, And in fact, he didn't realize that happiness is not an entitlement he is owed. It's his responsibility to find. That was the older son's mistake. What was the younger son's mistake? His mistaken approach to happiness was this. The younger son assumed that he would be happy living apart from his father, not with his father. And the mistake the younger son made was, on one hand, he took responsibility for his happiness. He tried to look for his own happiness. But the problem was, the mistake was, he was looking for happiness in all the wrong places. And it wasn't until he realized that he'd spent himself on all the wrong things that he realized that where he's really happy is with his father. And see, a big lesson from Jesus' parable is that you can't have lasting, full happiness without being close to your heavenly father. See, you and I, we were made to thrive in our Father's house. Ecclesiastes 3.11 puts it this way. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. See, what is that verse saying? When it says he has planted eternity in the human heart, in other words, it's as if in your heart, God has put a God-sized hole that only God can fill. 
And you can try to fill that hole with money, with power, with fame, with sex, with all the likes and followers you can find on social media, with all the status you can, you, know, you, you can accumulate, with all the toys you can find, but you will never be able to fill that hole because it is a God-sized hole that only God can fill. And until you allow God to fill that hole, you always feel like something is missing. You always feel like there's a missing piece to the puzzle. You are always going to feel like there's still an emptiness there. You know, in time past when I would struggle with pornography, especially in college, I would feel this need for intimacy. And so I would run to pornography with this feeling of emptiness, this empty feeling. And then I'd walk away from using pornography with an even emptier feeling. I thought the pornography would, would fill the hole in my life, would, would satisfy a need, would, 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 would cause that emptiness to go away. Instead, I walk away after using it feeling even emptier, made me, made me feel even worse. And there's a lesson in that, is that sin and happiness don't go together. You're guaranteed to lose when you give into lust. And see, the thing is this, perhaps the biggest lie that the enemy will try to convince you of is that you will be happy if you do things your way instead of God's way. You will be happy if you ignore your creator and you create your own path to happiness. And see, as sexy as that sounds, as Hollywood as that sounds, it's actually a lie. Because the truth is, sin and happiness don't go together. Sin and misery go together. And see, you know what goes together with happiness? It's not sin, it's holiness. Being close with God. See, that's why heaven is the happiest place of all. That's why hell is the most miserable place of all. And so when people say, oh, let's party like hell. Oh, it's funny like hell. They have no idea how miserable hell actually is. See, the fact is this, happiness and holiness go together. And, and that's why you're gonna find when you look at your happiest moments in life, very likely the happiest moments of your life were also the purest moments. In other words, it, it was that moment when you didn't just meet lust, but you met true love. Well, moments when you gave your best and you gave it your all and you did it the right way and, you, and it was received with joy. Times when you fought hard and you got something because of it. See, it's, it's because happiness and holiness go together. You know, because happiness and holiness go together, that's why Justin Bieber sings, you know, my fellow JB, Justin Bieber, he says, you know, the way you hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me. Makes, uh, was it? Uh, f feels so holy, 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 holy. See, that, that, that's what he sings. And see, here's the thing. Because happiness and holiness go together. That's why we say that God's commands are not prison bars to take away your freedom or to limit your happiness, but God's commands are more like keys to unlock your happiness. It's, it's, it's because God loves you and God cares about you. God cares about your happiness. That's why he gives us his word. Here's a question for today. Could it be that the reason why you are having a really tough time with life right now, could it be that the reason why you are kind of miserable right now is because you're trying to fill a God-sized hole in your life with something that is not God-sized? Could it be that you've been doing things your way instead of God's way, and as a result, that's why there's no joy in your life? That's why there's no peace in your life. It's because happiness and God go together. And see, because God knew that happiness and him go together. Because God loves you. God didn't want to be apart from you. So what did God do? He did everything he could to make a relationship with you and me possible. What did he do? Because when, when we were separated from God because of our sin, when each of us had decided to go our own way and ignore God's way, when each of us had disqualified ourselves from heaven and from God such that we could have nothing to do with God or heaven, not now, not tomorrow, not forever, no matter how hard we try, God didn't say, screw you, to hell with you, I abandon you, instead because God loves you because he cares about your happiness, because he couldn't bear to be in eternity without you, he did something. He sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. He sent Jesus Christ to pay our debt. So the death that we were supposed to die, that separation from God, Jesus assumed it on our behalf so that we could be forgiven, so that our debt could be paid, so that we could be reconciled to God. And not only did Jesus die on the cross so that we could be forgiven, he also rose again from the grave to show that you could trust every word that Jesus says. That Jesus is not some ordinary man or just some good teacher, but Jesus is who he claims to be. He is the Son of God. He has come that we may have life and life to the full. And see, when you know that, when you realize that, then it's up to us then to recognize, God, you're the reason I'm here. And it's only with you 
and through you that I'll truly find lasting full happiness. And see, when you realize that happiness is not just a reward that you earn or some, some, some entitlement you're owed, but it's actually your responsibility to find, when you take inventory, you take stock of the way God made you and what makes you happy, you start living that way. When, when most of all, when you receive and accept the gifts that God made possible, most of all, the gift of his son, Jesus, you're gonna be on your way to a happier you. Have you, had, have you learned something here today? Has this been beneficial to you? I really hope so. Today, I just wanna end this message by giving an opportunity to respond to God because we believe that you're, the way you respond is just as important as whatever you just heard. And so right now, for those of you who are here, you're watching the service, wherever you are, in your car, in your bedroom, in the bathroom, you know, outside, wherever you're watching the service right now, I wanna give you an opportunity to respond to God today. And I wanna pray specifically for those of you who wanna take ownership of your happiness. Maybe you've been crediting your happiness to something or someone else. You've been blaming your unhappiness on someone or someone else. And you realize today that actually it's time to take responsibility for my own happiness. It's time to own my own happiness. And if that's you and you want God's help to do that, wherever you're right now, just be present in the moment. I encourage you, don't be distracted by whatever else is going on around you right now. Don't worry about your neighbor, what they're doing. But this is between you and God. If you realize that you need God's help to take ownership of your happiness, I encourage you right now, wherever you are, just to lift up your hand to God. This is an expression of your need for God. And let the height of your hands reflect how much you need God today. And I just encourage you right now to pray with me. You can say, Heavenly Father, today I realize that happiness is not some reward I deserve. It's not some right I'm owed, but it's my responsibility to find. Please help me to appreciate how you made me and to realize what I need and what I don't need to be happy. Thank you that you love me. Please help me to take ownership of my happiness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you give God a big hand, a big shout in this place together right now? Oh, there's more than that. Give God all your praise in this place right now. One more prayer we want to pray. It's for those of you who want to take ownership of your happiness in the most important way. See, the most important way that you can take ownership of your happiness, most of all, more than anything else, is to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. It's to say, Jesus, I need you. I confess that I'm a sinner who needs a savior, that apart from you, I can't get to God. I can't meet my own standards, let alone God's standards but I realize that you died on the cross to pay for my sins and I want to receive that forgiveness. I want to receive your gift that you paid for on the cross for me. If that's you and you realize you need that, you want that, I'm going to encourage you just to pray this prayer with me right now. If that's you, why don't you just, again, not worrying about your neighbor, it doesn't concern them right now. This is between you and God. If you realize you need that gift, you want to receive that forgiveness from God today, why don't you lift up your hand to God as well. Let the height of your hands reflect how much you need him right now. And why don't you pray right now this prayer with me just to invite Jesus to come into your life. You can say, dear Jesus, thank you that you love me, that you care for me, that you died on the cross to pay for my sins, that you rose again to give me life. Today, I open up my heart. Please come in, forgive me of my sins, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, guess what? If you prayed that prayer just now and you meant it from your heart, I encourage you just to click that link. It might be a button that might say, I commit my life to Jesus, or it might be a link in your chat room. Uh, it's just, we have uh, something we want to give to you as a gift to congratulate you on making uh, the decision to accept Jesus Christ into your life. It's the most awesome decision you could possibly make. The Bible says when you pray that prayer, you mean that from your heart, then you are forgiven of your sins. You're a child of God. You're a citizen of heaven, and the best is yet to come. And so give, give, give a big hand to all of our friends who just prayed that prayer just now. A big congratulations to you. If you click that link, it'll also connect you to a page with a bunch of resources to help you unpack and make the most of the decision just made. A huge congratulations to you. We'd love to meet you one day. Uh, would love to, for, to, to connect with you uh, in the future. Praise God. 
right now as we get ready to respond to God with a song. I want to encourage you also at the same time to give your faithful tithes, your generous offerings. Uh, by the way, for those of you who've been giving to our Bibles for Kenya project, a huge thank you to you. You guys are such a generous church and we've been overwhelmed by the kind of response you guys have given. You guys have been very generous in offering to that cause. I encourage you, for those who haven't yet, uh, you still have a chance to do so. Uh, and let's also take great care of our church. Amen? Amen. We want to tithe faith to our church and then give to another cause. Make sure we take good care of our house as well, all right? Amen. We're going to do that. You guys are a generous church. Let's thank God uh, by giving our best, knowing that when we seek God's kingdom first, he adds what? He adds everything we need. And all he adds everything we need, he also builds his church through us as well. And so right now, the band is going to lead us in a song. Let's give God our best worship and we'll lead you in one last prayer at the end of it all. Praise God, the best yet to come. Let's give God our best worship right now. Can we give God a big hand, a big shout in this place together right now? Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much that you are a God that we can experience, not just a God that we know from afar or know from a distance, but that we can experience your love and your joy and your hope and your presence in our lives. Right now, we want to pray for every single person here because you know the plans you have for them, plans to prosper them and not to harm them, plans to give them hope in the future. I pray all of your blessing, your joy, your protection, your healing, your comfort, your wisdom, your strength, and your Holy Spirit to fill every single person here until we next meet again. Thank you, Jesus, that the reason why we even talk about happiness isn't just for ourselves. It's because this world needs hope. And in this time when we want to spread contagious hope, we pray you would use every single one of us here at Thrive to be a channel of contagious hope to every place we go, starting with our own homes and everything else, every place else. We thank you so much. We give you praise. Know that because Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose again from the grave, the best is yet to come. We thank you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you give God one more big hand, a big shout together right now? You guys are beautiful church inside and out. That's it for us here at Thrive Church Online. We're going to hand it back to our online hosts. Have an amazing rest of your Sunday. Have a great start to the week. Praise God, the best is yet to come. We'll see you guys for episode four of our Happy You series. Can't wait to see you. Invite a friend, and we'll see you guys really soon. Mwah. Love you guys. Take care. We'll see you guys really soon. Thank you for the powerful message, Pastor JB. It's indeed a message we can take with us in the week to follow. And now I will share some announcements with you. If this is your first time visiting us, we would love to hear from you. Text NEW to 604-285-5770 and we will mail you a Thrive stainless steel water bottle. If you made the important decision to receive Jesus Christ, let us know by texting BELIEVE to 604-285-5770 we have prepared a gift that includes a series of videos that may answer some of your questions about Christianity. And we hope that it will guide you on the right path to follow Jesus. If you would like to get baptized or find out more about baptism, go to mythrive.info forward slash baptism. All right, just like Pastor JB mentioned in his message today, he's prepared a special bonus content for our small group discussion this coming week. If you're not yet part of a small group, I really encourage you to join one today. A small group is a place where you can get connected with other thrivers, especially during COVID season when we can only meet online. Being in a small group is a crucial part for you to find support and to be prayed for. Let's not do life alone. Let's do life together and know that we are here for you. To sign up for a small group, simply visit mythrive.info today. The current message series, Happier You, Learning the Secrets to a Happier You started on Thanksgiving Sunday, October 11 and will carry on until Sunday, November 8. We invite you to join us next week for episode 4 of the Happier You message series. That's all for the announcements. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was really amazing spending this time with you. Don't forget to give your tithes and offerings on mythrive.info. Have a wonderful week and we will see you again next week at Thrive Church Online. Stay blessed and healthy and remember you are always in our praise.